Isaiah 35. Would you stand with us, please, for the reading of God's Word? Praise the Lord. The highway. This, this chapter speaks about the highway. It's not a highway of defeat, not a highway of sin. I think this Bible uh, is speaking about a highway of victory. Praise the Lord. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands, confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. And the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return. And come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you tonight for the privilege of being in this place. We thank you for the family of God. We thank you for helping us throughout the day with the financial need. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do through this message tonight. Hide us behind the cross and accomplish your purpose through this message. In Jesus' name, we ask it all. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I am remembering the family vacations that I had as a kid, those wonderful times when we planned and prepared and packed and took off on a journey. We often went to scenic places or zoos. I've been to most all the zoos to visit our relatives uh, we've been to historical places. Uh, vacations are what we call fun. There's nothing more fun. Uh, after you're dead broke and your nerves are on edge, you return home to get rested up and uh, show everyone your pictures and talk about the nice time you had. Family vacations. One of the little things that my dad always did before a vacation was he went to AAA and he got something called a triptych. Now, this is before the age of GPS and uh, cell phones and, and iPads. We went to AAA and got a trip tick. How many people here tonight know what a trip tick is? Yes, many hands. It's a series of spiral-bound maps that AAA gives you, showing the starting place and the destination point of your journey and all of the suggested routes in between it's a detailed map of your journey. Kind of obsolete today, but it was something that we used on our trips back then. I got to thinking about vacations and those trip ticks. I thought of this Bible is really like a trip tick, but it's never outdated. It is more current than Waze or Google or Apple or any other map that you can find. This trip tick has never changed. Never, you'll never end up on some back road. Uh, my family or somebody convinced me to get Waze. Have you ever heard of Waze? It's a uh, app for your phone that gives you directions. The difference with Waze, W-A-Z-E, is that it tells you all sorts of things like pothole ahead or car pulled off to the side. More importantly, it tells you, police ahead. <laughs> oh. So I got ways, and one of the first times, and I'm learning to use it, and one of the first times I used it, we were down to the ministerial brother Jacob over at Camp Hebron with my, my Jameson and I, and um, we were following ways. And you have to understand, I followed directions to get to Harrisburg. 
I know that that's dumb, but I can't help it. It's a mental problem I have, I guess. And um, so pretty soon we're going from the um, Camp Hebron down there in Halifax, and um, Waze tells me to turn right. We turned right. It was a dirt road. It's pitch black. As I recall, it was raining. Dirt road with potholes, and here we are bumping along through the, uh, through the deep woods, and Jameson is hollering at me and giving me all sorts of grief. I said, be quiet. I'm following my directions. <laughs> and I found out that there's an option on there that you can click uh, whether you want dirt roads or not. And I didn't have that clicked. And I was going on these back roads to get home from Camp Hebron. I want to tell you, this book will never take you on an... Uh, it'll never get you lost. It's going to take you all the way through. You know, when I thought about this triptych, I thought about this road map, I thought about the first page of the map could be called the City of Conviction. That working of the Holy Spirit upon our unsaved, unconverted souls that caused us to even want God. Acts 2.37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I thank God that I ever felt the pricks on my heart. One day, in the darkness of my night, I came to the city of conviction. What a starting point. We all start there, young or old. We remember the time when the blessed Holy Spirit began troubling our conscience, dealing with our soul, just as surely as in the physical realm every man has a heart and brain and lungs and blood, so in the soul of every man is born with a conscience. I wouldn't call this first city on the map the city of conviction. I wouldn't call it real pleasant, but I would call it good. Amen? I wouldn't have always said I was thankful for conviction, but this Sunday night I want to thank the blessed Holy Spirit one more time. Thank you, Holy Spirit, forever troubling the waters of my soul. Thank you that you never gave up on me. I resisted God. I couldn't tell you how many times I had resisted that still small voice, but I thank him that he never gave up on me. In service after service, I felt conviction when I would lay my head head on the pillow at night and attempt to go to sleep, conviction, when I would walk into the house and no one would be around, I would wonder if Jesus had come back and I was lost, conviction, not a pleasant experience, but thank God for every attempt that he made to get us to heaven, amen. Sinner, friend, backslider, if you're listening today, thank God that he speaks to you. Do not trifle with him. If there is anything that scares me to death, it's people backslidden perhaps out in sin who trifle with the Holy Spirit, play with conviction. You're in the danger zone when you begin to make light and loosely toss around the working of the Holy Spirit. No man comes to God unless the Spirit draws him. I'll tell you, if you're in a service where the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart, you ought to respond to that dealing. But if you walk away, you ought to still thank God that he dealt with you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy on me. Thank you for this city of conviction. And while I preach this simple message, you ought to thank God for conviction. Pray a prayer and say, thank you for dealing with me. If we need revival in any area, I believe it would be this. We need to pray that more people come through the city of conviction. Uh, we need people to get sick of their sin and hungry for God. Men continue in their pell-mell race for hell, seemingly unchecked, uncaring. Let us resolve to fast and pray and seek God for a revival of conviction. We can't produce conviction, but God does and prayer does move the hand of God. One day, with the words of the poet, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he hath made me glad the city of conviction. 
That would bring us to the next place of destination in our trip to heaven, the seaport of salvation. Oh, I love that hymn in our hymnal number 409. Talks about uh, my soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distressed till I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice. And I entered the haven of rest. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep, but in Jesus I'm safe evermore. When under conviction we hear the voice of Jesus calling, and we come. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When we bring that weight of sin to Jesus, I don't know where it was for you. Could have been at camp meeting. Perhaps it was down an old sawdust trail at revival meeting. It may have been in this very building. It may have been out with a friend praying or in the nighttime. I don't know where it was that you got saved. And yet I do know for all of us, it was at Calvary. Thank God. I, uh, I know that many will never have the opportunity to go to Jerusalem. But I tell you, every one of you can go to Calvary. You can say you've seen the Lord. You've been to Calvary through the witness of his word. Thank God for that moment of time when he saved you, forgave you of every sin you've ever committed. The songwriter gave his testimony this way. He said, I came to God one night in prayer with my heartaches and my cares. I said, dear father, here's my life I'm going through. And since I prayed and Jesus came, I have never been the same. I'm glad I stayed down on my knees till I prayed through. I'll never forget that wonderful hour when I felt his power and I prayed through. All heaven came down and God's glory abounded. The angels resounded when I prayed through. One said, you asked me how I gave my heart to Christ, I do not know. There came a yearning for him in my soul so long ago. I found earth's flowers would fade and die. I wept for something that would satisfy. And then, and then somehow I seemed to dare to lift my broken heart to God in prayer. I do not know. I cannot tell you how I only know. He is my Savior now. What a wonderful part of the journey to heaven is that seaport of salvation. It's not long after salvation until the journey brings you to a road of restitution. Luke chapter 19 tells about Zacchaeus. And uh, he said unto the Lord, Behold, I, he was a tax collector. He said, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation... I restore him fourfold. There were some people in Jericho who got a tax refund that they were not expecting. It didn't come from Donald Trump. It didn't come from Parliament. It didn't come from the House. It didn't come from the Senate. It came from that short, pudgy taxpayer, tax collector named Zacchaeus when he got old-time religion. They got a tax refund. They were able to put more money into the building fund <laughs> when Zacchaeus got religion. Oh, this place is not a particularly nice place in the road, this, this road of restitution. To begin to go back and confess wrongs done, things stolen, lies told. The modern church doesn't worry much about restitution. You just sign a card and believe and live happily ever after. That, that may be a vacation somewhere, makes you feel good, but it's not, it's not a journey that's going to lead to heaven. The journey to heaven will take you through the road of restitution. When a person goes through the road of restitution, you can be sort of sure that they really mean what they say. 
It's easy to say in church, we're going to do what the Lord wants us to do. We get all blessed singing, I'm going through, I'll pay the price, whatever others do. But when we really begin to make our restitutions, that's when the world knows we mean it. That's when the devil knows we mean it. That's when God knows we mean it. That's when we know we mean it. Amen? Amen. This has been the end of the journey for many. The devil knows that you mean business. He puts every roadblock in your way, obstacle after obstacle, problem after problem. The restitutions become huge mountains in our minds. Remember, friend, there is not one mountain tall enough to cause us to miss heaven. God will give you victory to make every restitution. The restitution that looms in your mind right now can be made with God's strength. And every restitution you do make, God comes in a special way and gives you an extra boost for the journey. It's not long in this highway to heaven before you begin to feel the call to the highway of holiness. Not long after you pass through conviction and salvation and restitution, that on this journey to heaven you feel that call to holiness. It's outlined in this passage that we've read tonight. The higher up religion. Step up here, son. Time and time again, I've heard testimonies of individuals never knowing about the teachings of holiness who after being genuinely saved, they began to long for something more. I'll never forget one of our saints here at the church years ago now was um, about ready to die one of her nurses began, was so, so moved upon. This nurse was a Christian, but she was so moved upon by this lady that she was caring for that she started asking this lady questions as she cared for her, really in her dying days. And um, one day, uh, this lady um, called, uh, this dear lady from our church called. She said, I want you to come down and explain to one of my nurses about holiness. I went down, found a lady who had been genuinely saved. She seemed to be walking in all the light that she knew. She had been reading her Bible, begun to hunger and thirst after something more. I explained the holiness message that all are born with a sin nature. A sin nature that is not forgiven in salvation. It is not something we did. It can't be forgiven. Our committed sins are forgiven. But the nature of sin must be cleansed and removed and the Holy Spirit comes in his fullness into the regenerated heart. We're to be his holy temple, acceptable in his sight and reserved to his purpose. We prayed together about it. She asked several questions and I left. A day or so later, it was back when we were living at the parsonage, the phone rang and it was that nurse calling to say, Pastor, I just wanted you to know that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that today God sanctified my heart. One of our, uh, one of our young men years ago from the Milesburg Church was saved through a campus ministry at Penn State University. It wasn't long before he began to search for something more. All newly converted just begin on a journey, and they begin to search for something. And um, he hungered for more. He was at a Christian bookstore in State College and began telling the man who owned the store uh, what he was feeling. The man was, um, was a man who had known better days, who ran the store, and though he no longer was part of the Holiness Church, as the boy began to talk to him, that man knew exactly, even though he had departed from the way, that man who ran that store knew exactly what this boy's problem was. And he said to the boy, what you need is to read some holiness books. Some holiness books. Well, that was new to the boy, but the owner of the bookstore got some old holiness books like from Salvation Army authors, Bringle and Booth and others, and gave them to this young college boy to read. It wasn't long 
before he was back. And he said, that's exactly, that is exactly what I'm searching for. That's exactly what I see in the scriptures. That's exactly what I'm looking for. He said, are there still churches around here that teach this? The bookstore owner who had left those churches years ago found himself saying, well, he said, if you can find a, a Pilgrim Holiness Church or God's Missionary Church, if you can find a church something like that, he said, I think they'll still teach it. So he looked in the phone book that particular year, and as I recall the story, for the first time ever, the Milesburg God's Missionary Church had advertised in the Yellow Pages. He called the pastor. He attended the next service. It was a Wednesday night prayer meeting. That college boy said, it was culture shock when I walked in the building. He said, um, the ladies with their long hair and dressed modestly. He said, uh, it was culture shock, but there was something about their singing and their testimonies and the glow of the countenance that caused them to know, this is what I want. This is what I'm searching for. What is it? It's the highway of holiness. There are a lot of beliefs and a lot of teachings about all kinds of religions. You don't have to explain it just the way I explain it. You don't have to explain it just exactly the way John Wesley explained it or the old Methodist church explained it or uh, the Church of the Nazarene or the Pilgrim Holiness Church or the old-time Quakers, the way they would have um, explained it. You don't have to explain it just the same way, but I'll tell you this much. After you've passed through the city of conviction and the seaport of salvation and the road of restitution, you're going to pass right through the highway of holiness. You're going to have to have a pure heart you, who will stand in his holy place, the man who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now just because you've passed through all of these places, all of these cities, still does not mean that you've arrived. This journey continues and this is the most important part. It's not the one who runs the swiftest, nor the one who runs for days, but the one who endures to the end. He shall be saved. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, Jesus said, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Lots of folks have started out on the journey been on the journey all a, a long time, but then took an exit, got off on a detour, took a worldly GPS the wrong direction, found themselves lost. Like the day I was late, I was in another city, running late to get to my uh, flight at the airport. And uh, so I was thankful for my GPS. It was taking me right to the airport, no time to spare. It took me to the airport, all right, but it didn't take me to the terminal. It took me right to the fence on the other end of the runway, and I was a good 15 minutes getting all the way around that huge city airport to where I could get in to uh, park the car and get in and get on the flight. I want to tell you, there's lots of people that have relied on other things, got off exits and detours, uh, crazy little tangents. It's amazing how many people have gone on little detours. It can be anything. The devil really doesn't care. I've been amazed. I told you about the lady really wanted to come here to church, but she didn't agree with the way we baptized. She even thought that it was right to put them all the way under. Uh, but uh, she just, the wording we used wasn't the way she wanted it, so she couldn't attend here. I, I don't want to squabble with you about things like that, but I just know in my heart, I don't want to take any exits about any of these things that would, uh, I meet people that are all hung up on prophecy. They, they just think that, uh, I, we have a, a group of people who think that Jesus can't come soon, uh, he can't come soon. 
that, um, that they don't hardly believe in the rapture. And I don't know what version they're reading. I mean, when I read the Bible, I, my version tells me in the last chapter of the book, Behold, I come quickly. Uh, but I'm not going to fall out over your kind of version. I believe whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. Do you ever meet anybody that gets all hung up on all of that? Uh, well, you know, here I believe in pan-trib. I believe it's all going to pan out in the end. I believe Jesus is coming back. And if I'm ready, I'm going to go up when he comes back. And I'm going to go to heaven one of these days. I just know we've got to be ready. I, I, I don't want to take any of these exits. I don't want to get off on any of these tangents, Brother Martin. You know what I'm saying? I want to keep right on the highway of holiness that leads all the way home. We have so many precious examples across our own congregation of people that could have got caught up in this or caught up in that or caught up in this, but they're just doing their best to keep the channels clear to keep saved, to keep sanctified, to keep the channels clear. And I believe this is a way that will lead us all the way home. Praise his precious name. Glory to his name. We traveled with the doctor all the way from Dayton, so we got on a lot of topics, and we got on the subject of, uh, of the church there in Papua New Guinea. One of the great missions leaders came back to the church one day and he had rewritten the manual and he wanted to uh, do a new thing. And uh, the people, uh, the, the pastor uh, set the missionary down and said, we're not going that direction. We're satisfied with what we found. And I was telling him about here in America, uh, we have faced this, we're older, we're an older group of Christians and we have many different groups. And I was telling him about the fact that you know, you've got to have it settled in your heart. You have to settle, have it settled in your heart. If you're tagged onto a church, if you're tagged onto a church, I love our church. We're going to keep fighting for our church, believing God for it. God has designed the church. But ladies and gentlemen, if the church changes its direction, I've got to keep my direction set on Jesus. Dear sister tunes into our services here, comes when she can, says, I just feel so bad. My church has not even had a revival meeting in years and years. There's no hunger for spiritual things. It's, it's just totally, uh, it's more of a social club. People come and they go. And it breaks my heart. And of course, I'm here on this end, so thankful for our church but we as pastors grieve, as you understand, and this isn't a slam, but we all, I think all of us, we grieve in the sense that we want to see more of God. We want to see more of his spirit. And these folks come in and they tell me, you have something special here. You have something so special here. You don't even know what you have. You don't know. We don't have what you have. This is the kind of thing they're telling us. I don't think we get any pride over that because we know our own situation. We just cry out to God, Lord, keep us on the highway of holiness. Keep your anointing on us. Keep the Spirit of God on us. We've got to be a committee of one. We've got to be a committee of one. So easy for, for us to just come and, uh, and just get through the service because you have so much on you. But if you'll think about it, if you will think about it, young couples, older folks, families, college students, if you'll think about it, if you get into that mode, if you'll think about it, you'll notice that it's that way Sunday after Sunday after a while. Do you know what that is? It's the devil. Brother Plank, have you ever gone to a church and not felt like being there and not felt like putting yourself into it? Absolutely. I know all about it. I travel all over the country, go to church all the time. Our conventions have, some of them have three services a day, some of them four services a day. I know what it is to have to shake myself. Now, Lord, you're going to have to help me. I don't want to just be here and get through it. Do you know what I've found when you shake yourself and ask God to help you? I found out he will. 
And I've come to many a service that I didn't want to be there. I've come to many a service that I didn't want to be there, and I left refreshed and revived in my soul. Thank God. You know, for some of us, it may mean moving up a row or two. You'd only be able to move up one. For some of us, it may mean putting our cell phones away. For some of us, it may mean working on getting here just a little earlier or maybe for some of us, the Sabbath is desecrated actually on Saturday night. You know what I'm saying? Because we are putting too much into that evening and the, and the night is far spent. Midnight, one o'clock, we drop into bed and then we come to church and we're all wore out. I don't know. I don't know what it is. All I know is we can't go month after month after month without God doing something in our heart. I can't. And I'm asking God to help me that it doesn't get routine. This is the last Sunday in April, May, and then we go into the summer months. And any pastor can, knows what I'm talking about. The summer months are tough because we're in a party feeling. We're happy. Fourth of July, picnics and running here and running there. And that's good to get together with friends and do... There's nothing wrong, you know, it's wonderful being a Christian. We do good things that we don't, we have fellowship one with another and we go places and we do things and we do things that we wake up the next morning and we don't have regrets. It's wonderful to be a Christian. Christians have the most fun, period. But don't let us have a vacation from church. Don't let us just glide through service after service. Help us, Lord, to keep the glory on the soul. Because all of these highways and cities and intersections, we want to stay on the highway that leads us all the way home. The musicians are coming. I want us to close the service with, uh, with a chorus. The devil doesn't like it, but I'm walking with the king. I just love that chorus. That's the way I feel. I have noticed that the devil doesn't like it. He just doesn't like it, but I'm just going to keep walking. Oh, don't, what are you about to, I'm just walking. Well, aren't you having a tough time? Yeah, a little tough at times, but I'm just keep, I'm going to keep walking. Well, I don't understand this. I don't either, but I'm going to keep walking. Well, didn't you see that? Yeah, I saw that, and I even saw more, but I'm going to keep walking. Brother Plank, aren't you worried about this? Yeah, I'm worried about that, and if you knew everything I knew, you'd be more worried than you are, but I'm going to keep walking. I feel like God's given us a wonderful church. I mean that. We don't have a constant undercurrent. We don't. There was, I have pastored here 25 years, and there have been times when there's a constant undercurrent. But that's not here. We have good people who are supporting. And uh, we don't have that undercurrent of criticism constant. And uh, there's been times when somebody will come to me, didn't you see that? What are you going to do about that? And I thought, woman, if you only knew what really is wrong in this church, you'd have a coronary arrest. If you think that's the biggest problem, you know what I'm saying? There's lots of problems because we're people. But I'm just going to keep walking. Amen? Let's keep walking with the king. Let's stand together. Oh, the devil doesn't like it, but I'm walking with the king. Walking with the king. Walking with the king. Oh, the devil doesn't like it, but I'm walking with the king. Every day, I'm walking with the king. Oh, hallelujah, I'm walking with the king. Praise his holy name. Every day the same, oh hallelujah, I'm walking with the King. Every day I'm walking with the King. I am on my way to heaven and I'm walking with the King. Walking with the King, walking with the King. I am on my way to heaven and I'm walking with the King.
every day. King, praise his holy name, every day the same, oh hallelujah, I'm walking with the King, every day I'm walking with the King, may God be with you this week, you're dismissed.